and we now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Questions four and seven have been withdrawn, and I call Mrs. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question one, please. Good Lashkan Korla. Hillsborough Forest has over 225,000 visits annually, spent on 1.7 million on travel costs, food, and drink. A survey in 2014 found that 88% of visitors rated the forest as very good or excellent. 99% said that they would um, probably or definitely recommend the forest as somewhere to visit. And 17% thought the quality of the forest had improved in the last three years. However, 11% thought it had become worse and suggested a need for toilets, better signposted walks, a play park and dogs to be kept on leads and not allowed to foul the public areas. Clearly, most visitors think Forest Service does a good job in Hillsborough, but it is clear that visitors also expect more. As resources are limited, I have, enough, I have encouraged Forest Service to seek partners to share the burden. This seems to, be, uh, to me to be an essential role for local government because most of the benefits fall to local people. I understand that Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council have had some early meetings to consider the potential for improvement, and I hope that that will go on to develop into a more formal partnership. Call Brenda Hill for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her detailed answer and also with all the statistics. But given the multiple departments that are involved in the management of Hillsborough Forest, can the Minister tell me what discussion her department has had to ensure the environmental conditions and the tree health are robustly monitored? I think it's fair to say we have a very robust um, tree uh, plant health strategy in place. Our Forest Service officials are on the ground. I know in the past you've expressed some concerns in relation to the forest and hopefully that's been resolved with the discussion which you've had with my officials. But certainly um, for me one of the key um, aspects and one of the positive things that we've been able to develop over the last number of years is actually opening up our forest to people, ensuring that there's more recreation in our forest. And I think we've been very successful in doing that alongside our partners, particularly I think in, when it comes to recreation, particularly working with our local councils. And there's been a number of very successful projects and I hope to see that flourish and continue to grow into the future. Um, th the Forest, which you speak about, I think also has more potential than some of the issues which have been highlighted. I think that well, there is some scope to do some of that work and going forward, but it's very much key to that work is going to be a partnership approach. I call Oliver McMullen. Call you. Thank you. Does the Minister share the concerns of the protesters who are currently protesting against oil exploration at Woodburn Forest, Carrick Fergus? Yes, well, I'm aware that there's obviously a considerable amount of public interest in drilling proposals that are um, ongoing at Woodburn, and it's a matter of um, record that I'm personally opposed to um, the exploration of fracking. However, forests at, Mud at Woodburn, just to be very clear, are managed by Forest Service. They're on land that's owned by Water Service, not Forest Service. I previously gave a commitment to this House and publicly that there would be no fracking on Forest Service land, and that remains my position. This is a matter for the Water Service and for my colleague, the Minister for Regional Development, to comment, particularly in relation to the arrangements for access by a drilling company. But certainly, I think that um, the considerable public interest that's been shown is, is um, legitimate concern that people have in relation to what are the environmental um, implications for any such drill and any proposed action that may come as a result of that. I call Alistair Patterson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister thus far for her answers. Can the Minister provide an update on staffing levels within the for Forest Service at present? And does she accept the concerns of many that the existing staff about the future ability to manage forests given the shrinking and ageing workforce? Well, firstly, I'm sure the member would share with me um, congratulations to Forest Service for moving into his constituency. I think that um, last week when I was up and I officially opened the new Forest Service headquarters, it's something that um, certainly I'm very passionate about, about decentralising public sector jobs. When I was there last week, um, I think we have something like 39 staff have now come on to site with um, the opportunity for up to 80 staff over the next number of years to actually move on to site also. So for me, that's a very positive development. In terms of the workforce, I don't have a breakdown of the age structure. However, I'm confident that all that needs to be done is being done. I'm confident that our staff are on the ground, that they're working with communities, that they're working with their partners and councils, that they're doing everything they can to open up, not just, um, not just to maintain the plant health of our forest, but to open up that forest for that wider social and recreational use. And I commend Forest Service for having that shift and to be able to, I suppose, to work with me and work with the department, to work with my predecessor in terms of us taking a completely different strategy in relation to forests, and I think it's been very successful. I call Chris Little. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if she's able to provide an update on the potential Forest Service acquisition of Cairn Wood and to assure the Assembly that she will uh, do all she can to ensure that this outstanding natural environment remains within public ownership? Yes, in terms of um, Cairn Wood, Forest Service is obviously preparing the business case for the transfer of land that's owned by Water Service at Bally Sally. And then it's too early to say what the preferred option for Forest Service will be, but I expect that it's going to require considerable involvement again from partners, particularly from Ards and North Down um, Borough Council, working in partnership with Forest Service to turn that into a reality. I'm also aware, again, that there's public cons or considerable public interest into this matter, but as I said, it's a matter for Water Service and my colleague and the regional Minister for Regional Development to comment on those current plans, but certainly um, I understand where the member's coming from and, and can support that and obviously trying to do all that we can. Moving on, I call Claire Hanna. <coughs> Question number two, please. Delivery of the agreed actions in the executive's response to going for growth spans a number of departments. DART has a role in taking forward over 40 actions supported um, improved animal health and welfare, innovation, market access and environmental sustainability. However, the key action for the new department is the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which will be delivered via the Rural Development Programme. The Foreign Business Improvement Scheme is a package of measures aimed at knowledge transfer, cooperation, innovation and capital investment in order to improve competitiveness and productivity in farming. The Executive agreed to prioritise the agri-food sector for support and to provide up to £250 million of capital and resource funding over the lifetime of the RDP for the Foreign Business Improvement Scheme, obviously subject to approved business cases and also keenly obviously subject to industry demand. Expenditure on the Farm Business Improvement Scheme has been profiled out to 2023. It's anticipated that up to £200 million will be available to support on-farm capital investment. Remaining funding will be allocated to the knowledge transfer, cooperation and innovation programmes, which will assist farmers to clearly identify their needs ahead of any capital investment and also to make informed decisions about developing their businesses. My departmental budget allocation for 16-17 includes 5 million capital funding to support the implementation of going for growth actions, including 2 million up for the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. The first phase of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which is the knowledge transfer, launched in November of 2015 with business development groups, and I was happy to announce recently that all eligible applications, over 3,200, would be offered a place within the groups. I hope to launch further phases of Farm Business Improvement Scheme, including farm family key skills, training and support for capital investment in coming weeks and months. Business cases are currently being finalised and schemes will launch as soon as, as possible once those have been approved. I call Claire Hanna for supplementary. Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Um, could the Minister outline how the recent announcement on the renewable obligation uh, certificates and the early closure of the renewable heat incentives have um, impacted on those farm recipients who would have been um, after that funding, particularly in relation to their energy costs? I think one of the, the biggest challenges we have in the agri-food sector is the fact that um, our all our manufacturing companies involved in that field are actually paying really high energy costs. It's one of the biggest challenges. NIFTA, actually, the Food and Drink Association, launched their manifesto today, and it particularly picked up on um, the fact that that's one of the biggest challenges that the industry faces. Thankfully, there's a piece of work that's ongoing within DETI, which is going to um, hopefully report over the next couple of weeks, which actually is going to put proposals to us as an executive as to how we can help the industry in going forward. And I'm very keen to see that piece of work because I think that in the continuing um, challenges that we have across all the sectors in agri-food, one of the biggest challenges is not it's, it's the margin that farmers are receiving for what they're producing. And I think that um, if we're going to be serious about trying to improve that margin, then we seriously need to look at how we can reduce production costs for farmers and processors like all the, all the people across the supply chain. In relation to RHIs, obviously we've had this discussion in this house over the last number of weeks. Um, I think that there are implications. Thankfully, we've had, uh, instead of a, 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 an abrupt end to the scheme. We've been able to see a situation where some companies have been able to adjust and hopefully finish the work which they had contracted to do. So there are um, implications, I think, for the wider industry. But I think that we need to be positive about the agri-food industry and going forward. I think we need to embrace the challenges that are there and we also need to embrace the opportunities that are there. One of the things that the chairperson of NIFTA actually said today was about positivity. It's about going forward and let's work together, government and industry, taking on all those challenges. Uh, taking on all those challenges and I'm certainly up for doing that and playing my part within my department and in the wider executive. I call William Irwin. And thank the Minister for her response to questions. Can I uh, ask the Minister when she hopes to open the first tranche of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme for applications? 
Yes, as I said, I'm working our way through the business cases as we speak, and I'm delighted that we've had over 3,200 people actually have come forward to the business development group. So that was the first tranche opening up. That was the first stage of the scheme opening up. I said from the start that we needed to take it forward in a coordinated manner, and that was the best way to, to take it forward. I think that um, as soon as we have the business case, which is hopefully going to be over the next, certainly before the end of the mandate, that I hope to be in a position where we'll be able to um, make an announcement around the farm business and the capital element to the farm business improvement scheme. I think that any farmers that are considering making any sort of capital investment on their farms, um, they may wish to start thinking about um, what they would need to do in, in advance of that, such as like assessing the needs of their businesses and getting ready for the scheme whenever it opens. But we're um, making sure that we uh, disseminate all the information in relation to um, the capital element of the scheme as soon as it comes forward. And we're very much doing that, uh, working with these business development groups, which I said, I am so delighted to see 3, over 3,200 coming forward. It shows that there is a desire within the industry to invest on farm, to look at production and see what the, the farmers can do for themselves. And I think that um, this scheme is going to allow them to be able to be more, production, more productive in the future. It's going to allow them more collaboration, working with others. And I think that it's going to have tremendous benefits for the wider farming industry. I call Joanne Dobson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, furthermore, Minister, with regard again to the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, um, when will the Minister provide detail of the list of eligible items that the farmers can apply for so that farmers can um, begin to prepare for expenditure for later this year? Well, really, as I said, we're working our way through the detail of all of that. That's part of the business case. I think that um, what I've, the rule of thumb I've always said to farmers is it's not going to be like the, um, the previous scheme. The, the, um, where there was a list of eligible items. I think this time it needs to be a bit more creative around actually helping people to deliver for products that they need on farm that'll help them become more efficient. So the detail, um, we've been working with the farming industry, we've been communicating this as we go through, we've taken a phased approach, I've communicated that message. People are eagerly awaiting the, the agreement for the business case where we're able to actually then go out and say, um, and we will communicate that through roadshows and other methods to make sure we get um, the message out there around what's available, how you can go about applying. But very much, I think, the farm business development groups have been key to actually communicating all of that as well. Moving on, I call David McNary. Financial corrections imposed by, on my department by the European Union since 2008 amount to €78 million. Euro. However, the actual financial cost to my department is lower at €59 million euro due to the fact that the recovery of overpaid monies to claimants is taken into account by the Commission. The total amount of disallowance should be considered in context of the funding that we receive during, uh, from the cap. During the period of 2007 to 2013, we received 2.2 billion euro under Pillar 1 and a further 329 million euro under Pillar 2 before any matched funding. Over the 14-20 budget period, Pillar 1 payments to our farmers will amount to 2.3 billion. In addition, 228 million of EU funds will be devoted to a rural development programme resulting in a total planned expenditure of under, uh, under the cap of €2.53 billion. Euro. I call David Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm somewhat astounded, actually flabbergasted with the amounts. Uh, these are fines and penalties. The Minister said little about the reasons uh, or if there have been repetitive failures. Given that she might elaborate on that, can she also tell us what in fact she is doing uh, to stop future fines and penalties of this nature? Yes, I think we've done a considerable body of work. If you'll remember, and I've said it to this House on numerous occasions in the past, the reasons for this alliance at different times, and particularly in relation to how actually Europe um, conducted their audits, and uh, would be a number of years later, and then replied, or applied things retrospectively. Um, that's led to challenges. However, year on year, I can certainly point to improvements year on year and been able to bring that disalliance down. Um, I don't have the breakdown of the figures, but I'm very happy to, to provide it to you. But certainly, um, we've been able to significantly make a difference in relation to the, the amounts of disallowance that, that have been applied. As I said, I've, I've talked up the, the, the amounts that we actually receive year on year in, um, here in terms of single farm payments, in terms of rural development programme. And um, we continue to um, have a programme now in place, which is going to lead us up into 2020, which will see 2.53 billion coming into the local economy. And that's something that I um, think that we can all be very clear that is something that the farming community need and that is something that the rural development, the wider rural community needs in terms of investment, investment in basic services, in terms of investment in rural business, rural tourism. All those factors will, will benefit immensely. The wider rural community will benefit immensely in terms of the contribution in, in terms of 2.53 billion in the planned spend from the EU budget. I call Gregory Campbell. 
Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, it's not a question in relation to the EU as the people of the United Kingdom in the next three months will decide that, um, but the issue relates to your membership of the EU. The Minister will be well aware, I'm sure, of the considerable time that her officials and her department have to spend when they are uh, facing EU restrictions, bureaucracy, guidelines, the fines issue that has just been, uh, has just been mentioned. Can she elaborate today, or if not today, uh, subsequently in writing, what uh, timeline that takes for all of her departmental officials to analyse those things to deliver for the people of Northern Ireland? Well, I can assure the member that my officials spend their time making sure that we distribute this funding in as quick a manner as we possibly can. Year-on-year -year improvements in terms of getting single farm payments into farmers' pockets. It's very clear that the evidence is there to back up what I'm saying. In terms of regulations, like I often hear this argument about regulations and, and for, see for anybody to think that regulations are going to disappear post-Brexit, they're diluted. They're absolutely diluted. There will always be regulations in place. If we want to trade within the European Union, if we were starting out tomorrow, not as a member of the European Union, and wanted to trade, we'll have to abide by regulations by Europe if we want to get into that market. So I think it's, it's, it's delusional, to say the least, the people, for to use the argument that coming out of Europe will mean that there will be no regulation for farmers. So I think that in terms of going forward, we need to look at the fact that there's £2.53 billion pounds available for our local economy. And where is that money going to be replaced from? Because I can, rest, I can, be, very sure, I can be very assured... I can be very assured that the British government have no intention of replacing that funding. I was at the NIFTA launch this morning, the Food and Drink Association, the agri-food industry, the representatives of the agri-food industry here in the north. They clearly said that the agri-food industry's um, interests are best served within Europe. They clearly set out the challenges that there are in terms and the implications in relation to trade. They clearly set it out and there's no doubt. And if anybody's in any doubt, they should pick up a copy of the document and they'll be able to read it for themselves. In terms, of, in terms of trade for our agri-food industry and going forward, we export 73% of what we produce. Food and drink, we export 90% of what we, we produce into the European market. So the implications for our local economy are absolutely immense. In terms of going back to uh, Mr Campbell's question, who he's getting quite exercised about, I have answered his question, but I will actually, um, through you, uh, Deputy Speaker, I will talk to officials around um, the timelines that he talked about, but I think officials would be best served would be best served trying to administer this money, get it out into the rural economy, get it right into farmers' pockets, instead of answering silly questions around lengths of time it takes to actually to chase up all those other things that he's talking about. I call Stuart Dixon. Minister, when it comes to fines and penalties, can you tell us who will be paying the fines and the penalties if there is, for example, a pollution um, uh, incident at Woodburn Forest uh, on land which you have administrative control over? The situation in relation to Woodburn um, and the fact that we actually, um, that this is an NI water issue in relation to the DRD, that it's not within my remit, that we, we land. take land. No, it's not my land. We take land. We take land. I've made that point very, very clear. Woodburn Forest is owned by NI Water. The trees are managed by the Department's Forest Service under a management agreement between both parties. That's factually correct. You can shake your head all you want. It's factually correct. I call Jim Allister. This is a side of the EU that Europhiles, like the Minister, don't like to talk about. The fact that they fine us tens of millions of euros on the administration of our own money. That comes back to us. But on the question of the strangling bureaucracy, the EU Commission has admitted that the cost of bureaucracy, their regulations on the economies, is 4% of GDP. What does that translate into in terms of the charge on agriculture in Northern Ireland? What is 4% of the GDP? Because that is the cost of regulation. That, that question would be on the original question. Over to the Minister if she wishes to reply. Well, just again to make this point that I mean, I heard the member make the point about you know, European bureaucracy, and I absolutely agree with that. There is too much red tape. There are obstacles to be, that we need to address. We do need to challenge Europe. We've been successful in doing that in some instances, particularly in relation to greening around cap reform. We have a way to go, but that's our job. We should, that's, we should be challenging Europe. We should be out there fighting our corner. We should be making our arguments. We're able, we're unfit to articulate our own arguments and to make the case and to join with other EU countries where we can do that to, to, in terms of strength of voice. But to say that there's not going to be any regulation in place post-Brexit 
is nonsense. There will be regulations in place, and the farming industry, the wider rural community, in terms of environmental issues, all those things, if we want to trade with Europe, there will be regulations in place and things to, and that we need to, 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 to deal with. So I, I make my point, and actually it's interesting, the last number of question times have all been quite often we have the conversation with Brexit. I think it's great. I continually say it's good to have this debate, and we're going to have a lot more of it in the months ahead. But it's very clear to me, when you look at NIFTA, who represent the agri-food industry, speaking this morning, are saying our place is better than Europe. The CBI, the Business Institute for the North, are saying we're better within Europe. When we look towards the, the, all, all the benefits that come for the agri-food industry, for the farming industry, I think we're better placed within Europe. But I want to caveat all that by saying that I do believe that there are issues within Europe that we need to challenge. And I consistently have said that. So I'm certainly not a Euro fad, but I'm certainly up for critical engagement with Europe. Moving on, I call Sam Gardner. Mr Deputy Speaker, question number five. The executive agreed that an emergency financial assistance scheme should be developed for non-domestic properties, including small businesses such as farms affected by the recent flooding. <clears throat> I also intend to extend the Homeowner Flood Protection Grant Scheme to small businesses, including farms. I have asked Rivers Agency to develop the scheme and to secure the necessary business case approval. I call Sam Gardner for supplement. I, I thank the Minister for her uh, concerns and her interest that she is taking in the situation. But many farmers in Upper Ban had land underwater for weeks, Minister. In England, it was recently announced that farmers there would be given support payments worth up to £20,000. Does the Minister think farmers here are less deserving and what action will she take to assist them financially? Well, obviously no, I don't think they're less deserving and I have made the case and the Executive has agreed that we would use the 1.3 million that we um, achieved in terms of um, the Treasury, British Treasury allocation, that we would use that for, for um, rural roads, that we would use it to do some survey work which would look at um, are there any other issue areas where, for example, rivers agency should be dredging and looking at all those things? So I think the executive has very clearly recognised that alongside that body of work, uh, we've committed to look towards supporting businesses that were flooded and farmers that were flooded. And I made that recommendation on the back of um, a subgroup of the executive that we, will get, that we will actually take that scheme forward. And we're in the process of doing that with DFP and my own rivers agency officials. The member will also be aware that I have recently launched an individual flood protection scheme. And I have decided that we should um, now include businesses in that scheme, and we're also working up the business case in that. So very clearly, we're, we're trying to take a uh, come at it where we can actually help businesses prevent themselves from flooding in the future by bringing forward this scheme also. I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. And can I say from the outset, I appreciate the efforts by the Rivers Agency and all other agencies during this flooding uh, crisis since the beginning of the year. But, Minister, can I ask you, Farmers and farming business are t saying to me that if they have to face something like this again, this could be the end of them in farming. And going forward, it's okay to state you're putting this and that in, in place. But what, what consultation are you having with those business, those farming businesses on the ground, to help mitigate against the likes of this flooding happening and having a great damaging effect on their farms going into the future? It's okay stating that we have certain things to put in place. But is this going to help them going forward? Because if it's not, it could be the end game for a lot of them. Yeah, there was a number. The member will know that the extreme weather that we're um, speaking about was was in fact extreme weather. There was so much rainfall fell over um, a number of days, and the, the department is part of. Um, if you remember, I announced that there would be two reviews. There would be a, te a technical sort of engineering review, but there will also be a review in terms of um, the response to, to the issues. But p part of all of that is around um, the department commissioning research around the extreme weather and what else we can do to disseminate that information through CAFRI. So working through our agricultural colleges and, and working with the, the farming community. I have been out on farm. I have visited quite a number of farms who actually have flooded. I have seen for myself firsthand and the concerns that farmers have around the damage to their land. That is why, um, in consultation with the executive, that we were able to agree that we should bring forward a scheme that will also address the hardship. It won't go to addressing all, you know, all the issues, maybe replacing all the land, but it certainly will go some way to helping farmers to get through what has been a very difficult period and extreme weather that has caused all the problems. So the executive are working our way through that as we speak. DFP and my own department are working to make sure we get that money out as quickly as possible. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. Uh, will the Minister confirm that the recently announced and much vaunted support scheme 
won't in fact be retrospectively applied to those farmers and businesses worst affected by the ravages of the floods around the shores of Loch Ney? No, I can't confirm that because it's not right. I call Ian Milne. Uh, Minister, I would like to explore further you know, uh, what measures uh, is your department taking to reduce future flooding risk for my good? Yes, well, we obviously have an ongoing programme of maintenance and upgrading of assets to ensure that existing drainage and flood defence infrastructure continues to protect people and property from flooding. Our, the Rivers Agency also carries out um, routine inspections and maintenance of designated open water courses, culverts and culvert inlet grills. When flood risk is heightened as a result of forecasted heavy rain, the agency increases the maintenance of culvert grills to reduce flood risk. Open urban water courses are inspected and maintained on a yearly basis, while open rural water courses are inspected at least every six years. Rivers Agency also constructs new infrastructure where this is cost beneficial to improve the level of protection to people and to property. The agency has an ongoing capital works programme which is subject to competing um, priorities from available funding. Ross Hussey is not in his place. I call Pam Cameron. Question number eight, please. Tail biting is one of the most challenging welfare issues within the pig sector. My department has not investigated the effect that overcrowding has on incidents of tail biting amongst pigs specifically, but did commission our literature review to identify practical solutions to reduce tail biting in pig production systems here. This review of literature and practices adopted in other member states was undertaken by the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute and involved collaboration across Europe, including case studies with individual pig producers. The presentation of the research report is available on the AFB website. In addition, AFB hosted a pig conference in November last year where the findings were disseminated. The project established that the casual factors of tail biting in pigs are multifactorial. In most cases, multiple factors such as stress, environment and genetics are required to, in a combination to trigger a tail bite outbreak. However, some individual pigs have a tendency to tail bite, even at a very low stress levels. Therefore, it is unlikely that one solution will solve tail biting on all farms. The Europe-wide Pig Welfare Directive, which came into force in March 2009, lays down minimum standards for the protection of pigs. The Welfare of Farmed Animal Regulations 2012 implements the Pig Welfare Directive here. Schedule 8 sets out the requirements for environmental enrichment. This requires that all pigs shall have permanent access to a sufficient quantity of materials such as straw, hay, wood, sawdust, peat, or a mixture of such which does not adversely affect the health of the animals to enable proper investigation and manipulation activities. Compliance is checked during on-farm inspections by my department, quality assurance audits, carried out by independent inspectors and quarterly visits by private veterinary practitioners. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Can I ask her to confirm what discussions and communications, if any, she has had uh, with the representatives from the proposed industrial-scale pig farm on the Ray Hill Road, Newton Abbey, in respect of such animal welfare issues? I haven't done any in terms of that application. There will be a planning application going forward, and um, if we are a formal consultee, then I can consult in relation to the information that we have around, um, I suppose, the standards that we would expect under the legislation that's already in place. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question nine. Following representations from the local heart race courses and from bookmakers, I commissioned my officials to review the horse racing fund charges and a public consultation was launched on 2 July 2015. My officials have given consideration to the 59 responses to the consultation, including two petitions. On 8 February, I had meetings with representatives of local off-course bookmakers and of the two local race courses. Approval for the new charges will now be sought from the Department of Finance and Personnel with a view to progressing legislation, which is subject to affirmative resolution as soon as possible. I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer and update on what is an ongoing issue. Uh, can the Minister give, give us some indication as to how she and the Department are, are helping sustain the excellent facilities which have been created at Down Royal and Down Patrick Race Courses? Yes, I mean, we obviously have a, an excellent um, Caffrey College in Enniskillen which focuses on equine, and the equine breeding. Um, Equitation, the farrier, the racing units in Enniskillen campus provide excellent resources to support the delivery of its learning provision. The campus um, horse racing and equestrian clubs are also used to support equine programme delivery, and students regularly complete um, in point to point races and other equine competitions, including the Balmore Show. So, very much so in terms of the expertise that we're developing, and that is working with the industry. I know that um, the industry are keen to know the outcome of the consultation, and I intend to make that decision 
and to talk to the EFP and have that through over the next number of weeks. And th that is the end of the period of time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I'm somewhat surprised this hasn't uh, been questioned in or asked in question time. But can the minister give an update on what discussions he's been having in respect of the um, reducing milk prices that dairy farmers are receiving? <coughs> Well, the member will know that I've been very active on this issue for um, quite some time. This is a, obviously there's a natural um, trend, if you like, within the dairy sector where prices fluctuate and then there's a trough. Unfortunately, this trough has been on for a significant period of time. You'll know that I have led delegations to both DEFRA and England, that we have um, also been to Europe on a number of occasions, that we were successful in terms of achieving the £5.1 million, pound, which was additional um, cash flow for the industry. That is the issue that we're dealing with here. We have positive future for the dairy sector. However, we have um, obviously overproduction, the Russian um, market not buying. A combination of factors are all coming together to create a perfect storm and it's really prolonging this cash flow issue for the dairy sector. I'm also, um, I've continued to host the, the dairy forum and held a meeting of that actually um, last week where we bring in the key dairy sec um, sec stakeholders. We brought in the banks, we brought in the HP companies, and that's something that I've done now on a number of occasions over the last 18 months to try and work with the sector. Um, very clearly, I think that, well, that my um, challenge to Europe remains that we need to continue to push for the review of intervention prices. We also need them to actually extend the intervention rates that, which they already have in place. So I've agreed with the industry that that's another um, job of work. And I know that myself and David Dobbin um, from the industry has also written to Europe in relation to that. So I think that we continue to work with the industry around the challenges that are, but this is very clearly a cash flow, and it's recognised by the industry, this is very cl clearly a cash flow issue. So I think the banks have a key role to play here, and I'm particularly um, engaged in, in relation to challenging the banks around how they can be creative, how they can create payment holidays, how they can create capital holidays, and I will continue with that body of work. I, I discussed it again this morning, I've discussed it, it's a, it's a daily topic in terms of um, what we need to be doing, and I'm working with the industry very closely in relation to trying to help where we can help. I call Ian McRae for supplementary. Thank you. Um, if the information that I've been received is correct, that we still haven't seen the prices um, bottomed out as, as yet, given that the Minister has given the commitment and indeed people within the industry to write to Europe, will the Minister go to Europe? And I appreciate that th um, weeks are, are running out in respect of. Um, the length of time before the election, but will she go to Europe, speak with the Commissioner and you know, basically put that plea to the European Commissioner to ensure that something is done before farmers that are currently struggling go out of business? Yes, so as I said, I have recently um, written again to Phil Hogan around the intervention rates and, and the length of time that is going to be in place, but yes, there is an Agricultural Council meeting where this will be discussed. Um, coming up over the next number of weeks and I would intend to be there to, to make sure we make a very strong case. Again, I think we do it collectively along with our Scottish counterparts. We do it collectively with um, DEFRA in England and also with um, Rebecca Evans and, and her team in terms of the Welsh Government. We very much come at this and, as making a very strong case for why our industry needs the support at this moment in time. I think we do need that inter intervention at a European level, but we also need, on a local level, we need the banks to be flexible and we need them to work with the industry. I, for my part, um, in terms of what I could deliver, it was around making sure that I get payments into farmers' pockets as quickly as possible, and that's something that I did achieve to deliver on, with over um, just around 97 per cent of people now paid, a few number of cases um, still to be resolved for, for varying reasons. But for my part, certainly, um, I'm continuing to do all that I can and work in conjunction with the industry, and I think that's very much recognised out there in the industry. Questions two and three have been withdrawn. Chris Hazard is not in his place. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, um, Minister, I note that this is uh, your final question time as the Dard Minister. Indeed, the final question time is Dard because the, the purple will be coming dearer soon. Uh, looking over the course of the, the past five years that you're uh, at the helm of the department, what do you consider to be the, the key achievements or highlights of the, over the course of the last five years? Um, yes, it is, it is um, my last question time in this mandate. and. Um, Five, five years uh, in this post, I think we've been able to uh, be very effective. I think in terms of what we've delivered for um, rural communities. I think one of the biggest challenges certainly um, has been cap reform and m making sure we uh, made our way through that and addressing an imbalance, an historic imbalance that was there. But I think the outcome that we got was a very much a fair outcome. 
it was something that commanded, um, I think, a lot of um, buy-in from right across the industry in terms of um, given that period of running to allow people and um, foreign businesses time to adjust. So, adjust. so I think that certainly um, cap reform is, is certainly been, been something I think that we, we can certainly claim as a success in terms of going forward. Particularly, I think the fact that um, we've been able to chart, uh, achieve the largest ever rural development programme and going forward again, significant benefits for, for the rural community, for the farming industry and for the environment. Because I think very much for, for me, from taking up office in this department, we recognise it as an economic department, but we recognise that it needed to deliver on three fronts for the environment, for the farming community and for rural. I think we've been certainly successful in doing that. Around um, tackling rural poverty and social isolation, again, delighted to be able to bring that, that project forward and to make such a difference to, every, to everybody in rural communities, particularly from small community groups right up to um, the work we're doing around the, the, um, getting people access to water, the work that we're doing with our networks and trying to upskill community groups to actually go after other funding sources. Um, and we'll continue to have that programme obviously going forward. HQ decentralisation as a whole, I think, has been a very positive project in terms of um, headquarters going into Ballykelly and, and all the other decentralisation progr pro programmes that um, helped create a fair distribution of public sector jobs, that helped um, create a rebalance of, of the local economy in terms of public sector jobs, and that's something that I think that we can, I can be certainly very proud of in terms of what was taken forward. We've broke into new markets recently into China. You know that's significant for the pork industry, and we're continuing to make headway in terms of breaking in other markets with a number of inspections coming up um, this year. The Rural Proofing Bill, which we're hopefully about to come to the final stage of over the next number of weeks again, has been a very significant um, achievement and something that is going to make a lasting impact for rural communities as all government departments, councils, and um, the arms length bodies in the relation to community planning. Minutes. We'll have to, um, have to rear proof and, and make sure they take into account the needs of rural dwellers when making policy decisions. <laughs> Could I ask members who wish to have conversations to do so quietly if they wish to, but to have the courtesy so that others can listen to the Minister's answer? I call Declan McAleer for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for the answer and I want to take the opportunity to commend her for an excellent five years in office and the leadership she has shown to the department. Um, looking forward, uh, what does the Minister believe will be the strategic priorities for the department as we move forward into the next mandate? Well, I think as the, as the new department is created, it's going to allow for, I think, improvements in terms of how we take things forward. We can shape things differently, particularly with the inclusion of the environment function going into the new DERA department. I think that in itself will be a welcome realignment and maybe will allow for improvements in terms of inspection regimes and hopefully remove a bit of the, the red tape and, and the bureaucracy of, of um, a number of inspectors, for example, coming on to farm. So I think that will be a good opportunity for, for that new department. And it'll take a bit of time to bed in, but I'm quite sure that that will all happen over the next number of months. The ANC is out for um, public consultation and I encourage, obviously, um, farmers to, to get involved in that debate around what that will um, look like in the future. I think that there's still obviously a priority in relation to rural broadband. Um, Delhi obviously has invested significantly, but there are still too many um, not spots. There are still too many rural people that can't get access, and where they can't get access, it's not it's at a speed that's not good enough. So I think that Dard still has a, a role to play in terms of trying to um, bridge those gaps and to support rural communities to, to have access. Because even today, as today, I actually heard of a business that is considering moving out of an area, rural area, because they don't can't get access. It's no good for their business to stay there. So. That's something that we as an executive need to, need to take on. One of the things that I announced over the last number of weeks would be my intention to make part payments this year, that um, we've got to the stage where we've improved things so much that we could get to the stage of making advance payments later this year if um, more and more farmers apply online. So I encourage um, everybody to, to get that message out there. We need about 70% of farmers to apply online, which would allow that to happen. Obviously, going forward, one of the, things that, um, one of the key things that we can do to assist the agri-food industry is opening up new markets. Because all, all sectors are struggling, prices are low, margins are low, and one of the things that, that we as an executive can do is provide stability. We can provide, um, go out, we can sell our wares, we can talk to the rest of the world around what we have to offer, and we can open up those new trade and those new market opportunities that will allow us to advance on the good relationships we've had and we've built up with, for example, China and the United States and others. And obviously, um, for me personally, I'd like to see the Tripsy programme going forward. <laughs> I call Karen McKevitt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her responses so far. In an earlier question uh, to Ms Dobson, the um, Farm Business Development Groups uh, got a mention, and I was wondering, is there any financial assistance uh, available to these groups in order to uh, protect their farm machinery and their stock? If you mean in relation to um, members attending the business development groups, 
is, um, just for clarity, in um, terms of what the members are asking me, there's actually, a, 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 in terms of if, if you apply to go in a business development group and you take part, there's actually a payment that's made to you as an individual farmer that allows you to maybe to, for example, employ somebody to be on farm whilst you're off farm. Paul Carn McKenna. Yeah. Can I thank the uh, Minister for um, her response? Uh, can I ask what discussions uh, the Dart officials have had with both the Gardaí um, and the police? Um, would the Minister agree with me that a multi agency um, approach uh, would be a way forward with these groups um, in order to uh, get the information out, like on farm safety, um, the, the like of rural broadband, and any funding that would be available so that communication skills are, are developed? Well, if you're, in particular, I think you're referring to rural crime, and, and there is an ongoing um, programme of work between the PSNI and the Garda Shikana around um, what we can do to tackle those things together. There is the cross-border task force, which is also in place now, which is looking at how we can tackle um, some of these issues together. There's a very close relationship um, with PSNI and the department's enforcement team, and particularly the veterinary officials who can identify animals, for example. So I think that there is a good um, body of work already ongoing. In relation to um, health and safety, again, across this island there's a significant body of work going on both with the health and safety executive here and with their um, equivalent in the 26th and actually it's the stand at the recent north south ministerial council meeting myself and minister coveney reaffirmed our commitment to try and to um, have one single messaging campaign because it's the same no matter if you live in cork or you live in you live in, uh, in Tyrone, if, if um, the health and safety challenges are there and they're there for everybody. So um, we're particularly working together around how we can use the same messaging, how we can get that PR out there and actually try to drive home the message in schools to young people in particular to sort of change that mindset that you need to think safety first. I call John Dallet. Uh, the Minister will know that many farmers are not happy bunnies with the prices they get for many of their pro produce at the farm gate. Uh, in this year of Northern Ireland Food and Drink, what steps is the department taking to develop a local food economy? Well, the member will know that, um, that I have very much seen this, as a, this department as an economic department, that we have a strategy in place that is to grow the, the entire agri-food industry, all sectors. There's targets set out for them all, but one of the challenges I think that for, for um, all sectors, for the industry, is the fact that there's not furnace in the supply chain. And that's one of the issues which I've tried to address. We have a fantastic product. We have um, farmers that produce food to the highest quality. We have something that we can market, this clean green image. We can grow in the world and market um, very easily. Um, but what we need to do in terms of um, when we look towards the future and what is the potential for the, the, the markets, we need to have farmers continue to produce food. And in order to be able to do that, we have to work with the industry. We have to challenge the furnace in the supply chain. And one of the things that I have done is, is establish a supply chain forum that actually looks at changing the relationships from the farmer right through to the processor, right through to the exporter. So I think that um, clearly, I think it's on record, my commitment to the agri-food industry. Uh, I think the year of food is a brilliant opportunity for us to market what we have. And I think that all the work that's planned throughout this year, I've attended a number of events already. Um, the event, actually NIFTA event this morning, um, we were also referring to the year of food and talking about the tremendous opportunity it, it gives us to market what we have, which is a fantastic product. I call John Dallet for a supplement. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have listened very carefully to the Minister and perhaps gazing into the crystal ball to the future. The Minister will acknowledge that the cooperative movement was the one organisation that gave farmers uh, hope for the future and goes on to do that co-ops like, like Patrick. What encouragement is the Minister giving to farmers to form more cooperatives that gives them a fair price and takes them out of the clutches of the large supermarkets that continue to offer derisory prices for their produce? Member makes a fair point and, and actually under the new rural development programme there are going to be opportunities for farmers to come together, to collaboratively, to work together. So there will be good opportunities. I, I actually agree with you. I do think that it's, um, farmers are, are stronger in groups, they'll be stronger working in cooperative and I think that anything that I can do to encourage that I'm certainly up for that. But there, will, there has been built into the new rural development programme opportunities for farmers if they so wish to actually work together collaboratively across a number of, of um, projects, but particularly one of the, the areas that's open to them is where or not they'd want to maybe look towards cooperative initiatives. Coming near the end of our time, could I ask Gordon Lenz for a brief question? Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, 
In terms of single farm payments, um, I am aware of an entrant who submitted all the information requested for new entrants over 12 months ago. They submitted their single um, farm payment application form by the 15th of May and have still not received anything back from DRD about their applications. Can I ask the Minister if it is satisfactory that this new entrant uh, who is struggling to establish their new business has still no idea if they're even going to get any single farm payment? Well, I can assure you that he's in, or whoever it is, is in the minority. I can't talk about the specific case, and everybody's case is different. I do not know what the individual has provided to the department, but if the member wants to drop me an email or come and chat to me about an individual case, that's no problem. But across the chamber floor, I could not um, comment on an individual case I don't know anything about. And that is the end of our period of question times. And can I uh, invite members to take their ease for a few moments while we change the uh, staff at the table?